Let's go on the record on cost number DC2016465, Chapa v. Dave and Buster's Inc. Council, make your appearances. T. Wynn for plaintiffs, Your Honor. Ken Riney and Clayton Carter for the defendant. Okay, I've read all the briefing here. A very interesting case. Uh, and again, a very sad case. Um, the uh, So I asked for a checklist order because, unfortunately, this is kind of a, a uh, legal intensive analysis, which is, uh, you know, which bystanders had a claim, uh, or at least a, a genuine issue of material fact as to whether or not they had a claim. Uh, and I read both sides. It was a little unclear to me what exactly was being contested here. Uh, so uh, I'll just go through the defendant's order kind of in, in order, and let's just talk about each of the individual claimants and whether or not they have a, a claim uh, or have a whether or not they can survive summary judgment. So the first one, I guess, is Cuba Chapa. Is that right? Correct. And what is his relationship to Dr. Chapa? Cuba Chapa is the nephew of Dr. Chapa, and he is the only bystander plaintiff at issue today. We, we did not move for summary judgment as to all of the bystander plaintiffs, just, and, and now that uh, plaintiffs Armando Martinez has withdrawn his bystander claim, all we have left today are the children of Emiliano, who are the nephews and niece of Dr. Chapa. So Cuba Chapa, is Dr. Chapa's nephew. Uh, defendants contend that his bystander claims uh, fail on two of the elements. Uh, the first one is the closely related element. As the nephew of Dr. Chapa as the primary victim, uh, that is not sufficient. Uh, that's, that's not a uh, sufficient relative for purposes of a bystander claim. There is an exception uh, for such relatives if he resided with the primary victim at the time of the incident. Now, although Cuba Chapa moved in with Dr. Chapa after this incident to be closer to his college, uh, as uh, Cuba Chapa himself has testified uh, in his deposition in this matter, he did not live with Dr. Chapa uh, at the time of this incident. Um, it was uh, Dr. Cuba testified that it was at some point in 2021 that he moved in with Dr. Chapa and his grandparents. Uh, he testified that in February of 2020, which is when this incident happened, he was living uh, with his father in, in Rockwell. Um, and that's where he lived, according to Cuba, throughout 2020. Uh, so Cuba's bystander claim as to Dr. Chapa as the primary victim fails on that element. However, it also fails on the second element uh, that Cuba was not aware that his uncle, Dr. Chapa, had been shot or was even involved in the incident until after he had evacuated and was outside and was told by his grandmother that his uncle had been shot. Uh, thus, Cuba also did not suffer shock as a result of a direct emotional impact from a sensory and contemporaneous observance of the incident, um, because he did not know that Dr. Chapa had been uh, shot or involved until minutes later outside when he was informed by his grandmother. So Cuba's bystander claim uh, with respect to Dr. Chapa as the primary victim fails on two elements. Ms. Webb? Your Honor, I'll take the uh, closely related issue first. I think that's number two in the order there. And uh, we have four adults, uh, Aneta Chapa, Mr. Chapa, who are his grandparents, who also live with Dr. Chapa, who is his uncle. We also have um, Emiliano Chapa and Dr. Chapa. All of these four adults testified, and it's it's uh, attached to uh, our response that Cuba Chapa did live with uh, Dr. Chapa, uh, along with Mr. and Mrs. Chapa at Dr. Chapa's home. Uh, and what it was was at the time of the incident. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, 
And what it was, was he was living there during the week to go to school. And then he would visit his father on the weekends. And so, you know, with, with these four adults all saying that he lived uh, with Dr. Chapa before, we say there's a plenty of evidence here uh, to show that uh, uh, this particular issue can survive summary judgment. Okay. And then what about the other issue? Okay. The other issue, the contempor contemporaneous uh, issue, it, uh, and I'll, I'll address this with all four uh, children because they all apply the same. Now with the contemporaneous uh, observation here, all four children were in the lobby with their father, Emiliano, uh, just a few feet away from their uncle uh, at the entrance when the gunshots were fired and all the kids and their father, Emiliano, looked toward the shattering glass in the direction of their uncle. And let me show you here, Your Honor. Um, I remember the picture, but you can show it. That's fine. Let me okay. go ahead and allow you to share screen. Thank you. And so they all witnessed it uh, with, I mean, at the instant uh, that it happened and it happened within, you know, just a minute, a couple minutes here. So at 159 and 19 seconds, they were all just standing in the lobby here and you see Dr. Chapa and Mr. Chapa coming in and the rest of the family. And I wanna tell you that this is the entirety of the Chapa family. Uh, all three kids of Mr. and Mrs. Chapa were here and their spouse and all four grandkids, that's all they have are these four grandkids. So so they were all here um, at the time, right before. And then you'll see here at 159 and 21 seconds, uh, when the gunshots were made and the glass was shattering, um, Dr. Chapa and Mr. Chapa were already here in the vestibule and everybody, you can see them looking towards there. So this is the contemporaneous observation that we're talking about here. And at 159 and 23 seconds, you can see them all scrambling uh, once they realize it, realizes what, what was going on. And um, so Emiliano is here, uh, down here with his kids and um, Mrs. Chapa is here. Uh, Mr. Chapa is running in, but then he runs back out into the vestibule. And then you can just see here in at 159 and 50 seconds, um, Emiliano Chapa, which uh, is the father of the four kids here, he comes out and he tries to save um, his brother. And at this point, uh, he, he, he saw, he said, he testified that he saw his, his father, but he didn't know if his brother was dead or not. So he goes into hypervigilance mode uh, and is, you know, telling everybody to, to you know, get down, get away. Um, and so from these things uh, here, we say that um, these kids had sen sensory and contemporaneous observation. Um, in the Keith case, which is a Texas Supreme Court case in 1998, um, the Texas Supreme Court, and I can bring that up also, if your honor would allow me, um, that case states that uh, the Texas Supreme Court uh, does not recognize bystander recovery when the relative arrived on scene um, at the time to see the injured loved one uh, place in an ambulance. And this was not the case here, Your Honor. It's very distinguishable uh, from what the Supreme Court's case said that they would not allow. Uh, in this case, uh, in the Keith case, Diana Keith was not at the scene at the when the accident occurred. She did not see or hear the crash. And uh, although the Texas Supreme Court says that they do not insists that a bystander must be within the zone of danger to recover. Texas law still requires that the bystander's presence when the injury occurred and the contemporaneous perception of the accident. And clearly you can see here that everyone uh, was right there in the middle of the action. They were within the zone of danger. They sensed it, they uh, felt it, they saw it, they heard it. Uh, I'm sure they could smell whatever was there. Uh, the shootout that involved both um, their father and their uncle. And they may not have comprehended it at the instant moment that the gunshot rang out, but they were there and they understood clearly what was fully transpiring only a few minutes later. And I believe that contemporaneous under Merriam-Webster's dictionary uh, states that 
uh, it is, let's see here, it is the existing, occurring, or originating during the same time. And so uh, that's what we have here. Therefore, there's at least a genuine issue of material fact as to all the children's sensory and contemporaneous observation of what occurred. Brief reply, Your Honor. Sure. So it's important to keep in mind that defendants are not uh, contesting the element, which is a separate element, that the bystander plaintiffs be located at or ne near the scene of the accident. That's a separate element, and defendants do not challenge that. Uh, there's the separate element of contemporaneous observance is, is a separate element. And although the plaintiffs, all the plaintiffs obviously saw something happen and heard the gunshot, saw the glass shatter because that caused them to uh, flee and evacuate. What they didn't know was that their uncle and that their grandfather was even walking into Dave and Buster's. The plaintiffs testified that they did not know that, it, that Dr. Chapa and Carlos Chapa were walking in at the time of the gunshots. Now, some of the plaintiffs, and that's not an issue today, um, uh, Anita Chapa and a few others were obviously there and they stuck around. The children who are the, at issue today all flee and they evacuated. They did not know, they did not contemporaneously observe Dr. Chapa getting shot or their father, uh, to a lesser extent, their father tending to Dr. Chapa. Um, so with respect to Cuba, he did not know that his uncle had been shot or was even involved or was even walking into Dave and Buster. Some of the plaintiffs testified they thought all 10 of them were inside the lobby. There were so many of them, they thought every. Is there any, so, so if I understand kind of your argument, they obviously perceived that something had happened, that there had been a gunshot. They perceive it simultaneously. It's contemporaneous with it. Is there any case law that says that you have to know who is being injured when this happens, that you contemporaneously realize that this is, your loved one, uh, or do you just have to perceive that it happened? Yes, Your Honor. It's the fact that they have to contemporary. The bystander claim is derivative of the injury sustained by the primary victim. They have to be. They have to have observed those serious injuries, uh, and that that's the whole point. Is that they did not observe Dr. Chapa's injuries until well after the fact, after they evacuated, after they were told that their uncle was involved and they were allowed back in uh, to Dave and Buster's. And, and by the time they came back in, Dr. Chapa was already being tended to uh, being given first aid. And in some of the plaintiff's instances uh, when the paramedics had already arrived. So they did not observe, uh, contemporaneously observe the, the serious injuries that Dr. Chapa sustained until well after the fact. Um, and then, you know, briefly as to Cuba's closely related uh, element, so it's important to keep in mind that Cuba is also an adult. He is not a minor. Uh, he is an adult, and he testified, you know, quote, did you live, or question, did you live at your grandparents' house in Louisville at any time in 2020? Answer, only visiting. Oh, question, okay, so at some point in 2021, you moved into your grandparents' house in Louisville. Answer, yes, sir. Question, and your uncle, Dr. Carlos Chapa, lives there as well. Answer, yes, sir. Question, so in February of 2020, which is the date of this incident at Dave and Buster's that happened on February 9th, 2020, where were you living? Answer, I was living in, I was living 2020, I was living at my father's in Rockwell. So we have to look at Plaintiff Cuba's own testimony in support of his own bystander claim he was not living with Dr. Chapa at the time of the incident. Okay, uh, I'm gonna go ahead. I think there's a fact issue here. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, deny the summary judgment as to this one. Uh, it sounds like the rest of them are, uh, are kind of have identical issues. Sure. So why don't you, for uh, 
Cuba, that, that, Juan, Emiliano. Is there two Emilianos? Is that? No, there's two minor plaintiffs. So Emiliano has brought it on behalf of MC and AC. So we have Cuba, Juan, MC, and AC. Um, and they, those four also claim bystander claim uh, with respect to their father, Emiliano, as the primary victim. And with respect uh, to that claim, um, so originally... What, what exactly was Emiliano's injury? So originally, uh, the claim was that Emiliano suffered a cut to his upper arm uh, from the glass shattering. He didn't even know that until well after the fact. And one of the first responders said, hey, your arm's bleeding a little bit. Uh, he didn't even you know, require first aid, um, didn't do anything about it. He also claimed that when he was helping drag his brother further inside, um, that as he was crouched down, dragging him in, he slipped and his knee hit the ground and he sustained a bruised knee. Um, now, since filing our motion for summary judgment, uh, they have, uh, you know, kind of conceded that that was not a serious injury, uh, but they now claim that the Emiliano's injury that they observe, and which forms the basis of their bystander claim, uh, is that he uh, suffered hypervigilance. Uh, and PTSD as a result of the incident. And now a, a serious non-physical injury and, and with respect to a bystander claim must be of such a shocking and disturbing nature that mental anguish was a highly foreseeable result. Hypervigilance is a behavior, uh, conduct, or state of mind. It's not an injury, uh, much less a serious injury. And PTSD, by definition, would have manifested itself after the incident. And thus, the plaintiffs at issue today could not have contemporaneously perceived Emiliano's PTSD at the time of the incident. As we've just, so, so this hypervigilance conduct and his PTSD are not sufficient uh, injuries to support uh, a bystander claim. But again, uh, they also fail to meet the second, a second element with respect to Emiliano as a primary victim because of their uh, contemporaneous observance or lack thereof of these alleged injuries. So even assuming uh, that hypervigilance is an injury or that PTSD is an injury that manifests itself at the time of the incident, again, they did not contemporaneously observe uh, these injuries. Uh, because, again, they didn't know uh, that their relatives were involved until after the fact when they were told uh, by their grandmother. Uh, but again, you know, they may have observed his hypervigilance. Um, but again, that's not that's not an injury. That's that's behavior and conduct. And th it's logically impossible for them to have observed contemporaneously his PTSD, uh, because that is post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, that manifested itself after the incident. So uh, the remaining Cuba, Juan, MC, and AC's bystander claims as to Emiliano as the primary victim fail on two of the elements as well. Response? Uh, Your Honor, uh, just very quickly on the contemporaneous observation, um, you'll see that we have attached Cuba Chapa's uh, deposition from pages 35 to 36. Uh, and I quote, question, is that what you were referring to earlier when you looked up and saw the glass shatter? Answer, yes, sir. Question, and there you are looking toward it. At this point, do you realize that your uncle and your grandfather are inside the doorway? Answer, yes, sir. Question, do you remember seeing them in the doorway at that point when the glass shattered? Answer, yes, sir. So at the, at the time, right before the gunshots and they weren't looking, uh, they didn't know that they were coming in. But at the time of the gunshots, and you can see in the video that everybody was looking at the shattered glass and towards the front, they understood that their grandfather and their uncle were there in the vestibule. And then as far as serious injury, Your Honor, in the Rigby case, well, first of all, Boyles v. Kerr uh, states that 
um, a bystander, the, the victim has to have suffered a serious injury. And in uh, Rigby, in the uh, Texas law, in the Healthcare Centers of Texas Inc. versus Rigby case, which is a Texas appellate court from Houston, 14th district, uh, where the petition uh, was denied. Let me, if I may, bring that up uh, to the shared screen. It states on page 622 here, it says here, for example, we have not recognized bystander recovery simply because a relative arrived on the scene. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, in, in time to see the injured loved one. I'm so sorry, that's the wrong one. Um, Trevino, Trevino is the case. Trevino is the case where the um, Texas Supreme, sorry, where the Texas Supreme Court states states that um, the physical injury of the primary victim uh, is not required, uh, but basically they have to be present there. And here, I apologize, Your Honor, I'm so sorry. Rigby, there's Rigby, so sorry. Rigby says, physical injury, however, is not required for bystander recovery. It says here, the Texas, the Supreme Court has not recognized a requirement of physical injury. So here, even though um, the defendant the entire time was looking uh, for the physical injury by Emiliano, uh, bystander claim does not require a physical injury uh, by the primary victim, Emiliano Chapa. And here, um, Emiliano Chapa went straight into a severe hypervigilance mode. He was in the middle of exploding glass. He was covering his daughter, AC, from the exploding uh, glass. He was attempting to get his brother, uh, Dr. Chapa, to safety. He was helping the police locate the shooter and the witnesses. And as a result, he was diagnosed with PTSD and missed 47 days of work. Now, what we're saying with the PTSD, uh, PTSD and the missed 47 days of work it shows the facts, how serious his injuries were. And here we'll have uh, what we put in the uh, response is Cuba's uh, deposition on page 21 uh, states that starting at line seven, he stated that he saw his father So when we went through the front doors to the bar area, that's where I saw my uncle kind of laying there, kind of blood on his leg and my dad kind of paranoid. And so there's the hypervigilance that he observed. Then Cuba, Cuba uh, from Juan and then Cuba, Chapa says, I noticed my uncle was on the floor and my father was next to him trying to help him. And I noticed very large holes in my uncle. And basically what happened after that, he just stood by their side. So they were there before your honor, before the ambulance even arrived on scene. So they were there contemporaneously. Uh, we say that Emiliano's injury was serious. I don't believe that anybody would, would say that being severely hypervigilant is not an injury uh, for which you have to seek medical attention at the level that his father, that Emiliano suffered. So right there, we are saying that um, from that, the contemporaneous uh, observation element and the serious injury uh, suffered by Emiliano 
uh, ha have at least genuine issue of material fact for which a jury can decide. Brief reply, Your Honor. Yeah, we got to get this over with. Sure. Yeah. So the testimony that counsel just uh, cited to, that was not at the time of the incident. That is important to keep in mind that Juan and Cuba are talking about after they had evacuated and after they had, you know, the inside had been cleared uh, and they were allowed back inside, that's when they observed uh, the injuries to Dr. Chapa. Uh, and he was already being tended to, first aid was being given. Uh, and so th that's, that's not a contemporaneous observance of, of the injury. And we also have to keep in mind that these claims are now only as to Emiliana, all right? So, and, and uh, counsel cited to the testimony of Cuba as to him realizing that Dr. Chapa and his grandfather were walking into the center at the time, that's irrelevant for purposes of the claim with respect to Emiliano as a primary victim. Um, we're talking about observance of Emiliano's injuries uh, and whether it was shielding his daughter or uh, this, that, or the other. Again, that's behavior. That's conduct. That is not a contemporaneous. There's been no citation to any contemporaneous observance of this hypervigilance. Uh, the testimony just cited uh, was the observance of Emiliano after the incident, after he was being tended to. Uh, and again, you know, although a physical injury may not necessarily be required, uh, and that's such that a mental injury would be sufficient, it still has to be serious or fatal to succeed on a bystander claim. Hypervigilance, uh, again, we don't concede that it's an injury, but even if it were, it's certainly not a serious injury. And again, PTSD is not something that they could have contemporaneously observed because that is something that develops after a traumatic event. I have one citation, uh, Your Honor. Okay, uh, yeah, we, I, I can't just have this go, go back. I'm gonna deny the summary judgment, uh, I think, but I do think these claims are pretty uh, tangential uh, to say the least. So, uh, but we'll see how it goes. And uh, when is this case set for trial? February, Your Honor. All right, have y'all been to mediation? Uh, we're scheduled uh, in about 30 10th. days, November 10th. Okay. Thank you guys. I've signed the order and you should get it scanned in by the end of the day. Thank, thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor. May we be dismissed? You, you may. You have a great day. You too. Thank you. All right. I just want to make sure is anyone else here on the dismissal docket? Okay. Uh, anyone here on the scheduling conference docket? Uh, I think we have Boggle versus Ala Deru. Anyone here on that case? Uh, yes, Your Honor, Chip Brooker for the plaintiff. And Lynn okay. Proctor for defendant Uber. Okay. Uh, so have you guys come up with the scheduling order on this yet? Your Honor, actually late last week, we filed an agreed uh, motion to stay this case. Uh, plaintiff is optimistic this case might be able to be resolved via a, a collateral UMUIM claim that's pending. Uh, this is the underlying uh, direct liability claim. Um, and Uber uh, has the UM, UMUIM claim as well. So they've, they've agreed that maybe we try to stay this case for some period of time so that we can see if uh, we can even get it dismissed. I, I, I apologize. I don't do that. And so we're going to need to pick a trial setting. I mean, okay. if there's some mandatory statutory stay, I'll do it. But I don't just stay cases if people think it's going to settle. So uh, when do you all want to set this for trial? I. Uh, I I am fine anytime in the fall, sir. Next fall? Yes, sir. Okay. Mr. Proctor? Uh, I think I think that sounds reasonable because that puts us at least 12 months out. So I'd, I'd say in the fall is, is good for an initial setting, yes. Uh, September 6th, 13th, 20th, or 27th? Uh, I would prefer the 27th, Your Honor, based on my current settings. Uh, I don't judge. I have I have conflicting settings for that week. Um, the 20th, I, have, is it, how does so I don't know if you want to set it on top of that for the first setting and give it a shot. 20th, Mr. Brooker. That's fine, Your Honor. All right, we'll set it on the 20th. 
Would you skip me an agreed scheduling order on this? Will we'll do, Your Honor. And uh, do you have a mediator that you want to go ahead and appoint? Who do you want to use? I, I anticipate that Mr. Proctor and I can work out an agreement on that with the scheduling order. Okay. All right. We'll go ahead and set you to September 20th of 2022. Thank you, Your Honor. Are we right. excused? You are excused. Thank you so much. You have a good day. Thank you, Judge. St. Augustine Estate Apartments versus Dow Central Appraisal District. Anyone here on that case? Let's see if I got a scheduling order on this. Okay, and there's no one here uh, here on the St. Augustine case. Anyone else here on the uh, scheduling conference docket? I want to go ahead and uh, dewop this case. Okay, anyone here on uh, Dallas Chung Yon Presbyterian Church versus Lee? Good morning, Judge Dustin Gaines for the plaintiff. Anyone here for the defendant? All right, do you have. Uh, I know there was an issue as to notice on this. Did you uh, put them on notice? We, we did judge. However, um, we set the hearing on Friday and we forwarded the link that we had and um, we just received the link for today just a little bit ago. So we put them on notice for the hearing, but the link for today's Zoom hearing would take them to last Friday's. Um, when I tried to get in just a little bit ago, it was doing the same thing. So. Um, we had a courier hand deliver everything over to them with the notice of hearing and the petition on Friday. They got it at two o'clock, um, but that's where we're at as far as the link. So, okay, wait, so you sent them last week's link? Yeah, Friday we set notice. the hearing during court and we hadn't gotten, we just got the link for this hearing right now just a few minutes ago. Um, Do you have an email address or phone number for these folks? We've got a phone number, yes, Judge. Why don't you go ahead and call them and see if we okay. can get them on the phone and we can try to figure this out. Okay. Thank you. You can, you can go on mute so I can talk to the other folks. Uh, Ms. Emerson, what are you here for? Um, I'm here on the David Jackson versus Preston Towers. Plaintiff's uh, motion to compel entry and inspection set for hearing. But on Friday, we also filed an emergency motion for withdrawal of counsel that we would um, ask the court to consider at this time as well. Who do you represent? Preston, the Preston Towers Condominium Association and um, ICI Management Intercity. Uh, and, and you want to withdraw? Uh, yes, Your Honor. So David Johnson's on the line. He's lead counsel. Good morning. And we are. Your Honor, we yeah. Last week we we uh, discovered a conflict that exists between our two clients, the association and the former management company. I talked to Ms. Alstron on Friday. 
She indicated she's not opposed to our motion to withdraw. However, uh, we're also asking the court uh, continue the hearing that's set for today as well as any other hearings that the court has in order to let us get out and get new counsel in. Ms. Allstrom. Um, yes, uh, Your Honor, we, we, I did speak with uh, uh, Mr. Johnson on Friday and while I understand that um, his um, just come to their attention apparently that there's a conflict um, we have been expressing a potential conflict between the two defense in this case for probably close to two years now. Um, so I'm not, I'm not entirely sure why this is now um, such a pressing matter, perhaps because, you know, we have begun to press and we set a motion to appoint a receiver as well as motion to compel inspection and entry. Um, so while I completely understand their request to withdraw and we are not opposing it, we are absolutely opposing the continuance of today's hearing as well as the other um, um, deadlines that were, were set out, if you recall, at the hearing on October, where the court um, pushed back our request for a motion to appoint a receiver, but also indicated some deadlines between the parties to allow depositions to go forward in advance of that hearing. Um, so they're asking for all of those deadlines to be pushed back as well. Um, and that just really puts us in a position for continued delay that I don't think should be, um, again, this would all prejudice the, the, the plaintiff here in this case. And if there's a conflict, this should have been addressed well earlier. We are now set for trial on December 7th. And this will be um, prior to Mr. Johnson and Ms. Emerson, there was actually another counsel that is also withdrawn from this case. So we've been continually delayed, Your Honor, in this case, and we would like to keep it moving forward if at all possible. Your Honor, brief, brief response on that. The, um, they did file a motion to appoint a receiver trying to wrestle control away from my client of this building. Um, that obviously has prompted uh, quite a few conversations there within the association. And this is the other client we have is a former management company for the building. Uh, they, they ceased to be the management company on September 1st. Prior to that, they had been the management company for decades in this building. So they, they filed their motion to appoint the receiver. They've also recently amended their petition within the last two weeks to add new claims. Uh, they've also requested depositions of multiple people and it, it, these conversations have um, with our clients have a conflict has come to light. I can't really get into it because of confidentiality, but there is clearly a conflict. We've talked with the carriers. We've talked with the clients. They are appointing new counsel. New counsel should be appointed today. This is a very, very large file. Uh, so it's going to take some time to get new counsel in. It's going to take some time to get them meeting with the appropriate people. Your Honor ordered four depositions to take place before October 22nd in order to respond to their motion to appoint the receiver. Uh, we'd ask that the motion to appoint the receiver hearing to be postponed at least by 30 days to allow new counsel to come in, um, get these depositions scheduled, prepare these so witnesses. The, 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 let's kind of piecemeal this a little bit. So uh, let me ask Ms. Alster in this. So I, I don't personally have any problem with moving this if there's an agreement. Uh, that's what I typically do if there's an agreement, but there's not an agreement. Uh, Ms. Halstrand says that she's been raising this issue for quite some time about the conflict. Uh, uh, is that true or not? She hasn't raised an issue to us as to whether there's a conflict, but honestly, Your Honor, that's, that's our determination, not plaintiff's determination. Um, and the, the conflict uh, that has arisen uh, just came to our attention, honestly, within the last week. Um, and again, I cannot get into specifics as to how that came uh, to our attention, but I will tell the court it has been prompted by recent developments in the case, most specifically the motion to appoint the receiver that was filed um, and also plaintiffs, uh, I think, sixth amended petition that they just filed alleging new claims, new damages, recent damages um, and new causes of action. So. That's what prompted the conflict. When we discovered the conflict, we had numerous conversations last Thursday. I talked to Ms. Alstron on Friday morning. We filed our motion promptly, which we're required to do under the rules. Um, and, and that's why we filed the motion withdrawal. The, um, 
in discussing this issue with our clients, it's my understanding that the association will be appointing counsel, I believe today, and ICI, the former management company, will be appointing their own counsel, and hopefully that occurs today as well. Uh, but those are some moving parts that are going on right now, Your Honor. But they're going to have separate counsel moving forward. They will not have the same counsel representing both parties. Uh, Ms. Alstrom, Your Honor, we have. I, I, guess, I, I guess the number one issue is: Do you oppose moving the hearing for today? That's really the. Uh, so I guess there's two issues. One: Do you oppose hearing moving the hearing today? Then two: Do you oppose hear, me hearing the emergency motion to withdraw? Your Honor, um, this is Chris Payne, and I'm here representing uh, David Jackson together with Ms. Alstron. Um, and if I could be heard on that, Your Honor, look, if um, they claim that it is a mandatory withdrawal, which they do specifically in their, their motion, um, I'm not going to question uh, their ethics. They know what the responsibilities are under the uh, ethics. Chris, Chris, you're muted. Yes, Chris, you just got muted. muted. Oh. Uh, we can't hear you. Yeah, I, I'm not sure what happened there, Your Honor, but I apologize. Um, I, I don't doubt if they say it's an ethical responsibility that they've got and it's mandatory, uh, that's fine. We would, we would agree to moving today's hearing but we would like to have it set sometime yet this week if counsel are going to be um, appointed today or tomorrow. Uh, this is a simple motion. This is just to enter into and inspect adjoining apartments from Mr. Jackson that uh, have had water penetration issues just as he has. That's all we're asking for. That's not something that's going to require any kind of uh, intense uh, getting up to speed, things uh, where they've got to read depositions, go through pleadings and stuff. That's pretty straightforward, Your Honor, and there's no reason why that can't be handled yet this week if the court's docket will permit it. Your Honor, a brief response to that. Their motion to compel is actually seeking to enter other non-party um, residences. They want to go into the homes of other people. Uh, we filed a response to their motion to compel last Wednesday, but be, to be very clear, what they're seeking is the court ordering them to go into a non-party's personal. Uh, okay, so what, are, are you wanting to argue the merits today? Are you, or are you... Well, I mean, we I can argue it, but but honestly, I don't even know if I if I should, considering that we now have a conflict and we need to withdraw. But um, I just want the court to be clear what they've requested in that motion to compel. So there, there's the issue, the, for, the issue on the table at the moment is, so are you opposing them withdrawing today? No, Your Honor. Um, if, they, if they maintain that ethically they're required to do so, um, I take them at their word and um, will so, not. Okay, so, so do you oppose the continuation of all the deadlines they're asking to, to continue. We do, Your Honor. And here's the problem that I foresee. Um, if we back some of these up, then, and, and even if it's the 30 days that was suggested, that would put us at November 29th for the motion to appoint receiver. Logically, the court would look at that and say, I'm eight days away from the trial setting. Why don't we just go forward with the trial setting? I, I don't think realistically, we're going to get heard on the 7th, but we well might. And what's happening here is things are being delayed and delayed and delayed. The court moved the receivership hearing back after um, a hearing on October 1st. And so what we're, this is just a continuing um, problem with delays. And the court also imposed a deadline to do depositions by the 22nd. If we can get a order that keeps those deadlines, we'd be fine. But um, we do oppose any kind of delay, Your Honor. What, what makes the most sense to me, uh, though this is not a ruling, it's just kind of an observation at this point, is 
to move both of these hearings to Friday. And, and what I'm, the reason my thought process is, is that uh, I've been in situations like this before where attorneys have said, hey, we have new counsel coming in, they're gonna be in today or tomorrow, and then it never happens or it happens much right. longer than we anticipated. I've had other situations where they, you know, they, they come in just like they're supposed to, which I anticipate will probably happen in this case. Uh, though I don't know for sure. Um, and so it makes more sense to me for us to be discussing discussing all of these scheduling issues and the merits of this uh, with new counsel as opposed to with uh, exiting counsel. And so uh, and and it, there's so, so I guess that's kind of my thought. what what, what do y'all think about this? who I'm moving both? hearings to Friday. Your Honor, I'm, I'm not opposed to that. Um, in fact, after I get off the phone with you, I've got a, or off the Zoom or whatever with the court, um, I've got calls set up with the clients, the carriers, and um, I believe at least one of the new counsels. So I think that we should, like I said, I, you know, nothing's solid yet, but we should have new counsel on board, hopefully today. Um, and then, yeah, I would, I, I think that, that would be best to have them on, on Friday as well to discuss scheduling issues moving forward. Your Honor, we won't oppose that and it would be in favor of it. And if they will have a uh, new council uh, contact us, we'll try and work some type of an agreement out in terms of scheduling before the hearing, if we can. So we'll, we'll move both these hearings to Friday at uh, Nine o'clock, nine thirty. What What are your thoughts? E either one's fine, Your Honor. Same here, Your Honor. Either one is fine. Let's do nine thirty. So uh, the hearing on this, there's two hearings actually. There's a motion to compel and a motion to withdraw that just got filed. So both of these hearings are being reset to Friday at nine thirty. Uh, okay, and then uh, hopefully you guys will have a chance to chat, and uh, hopefully it'll, uh, we can get as much of this resolved as possible. So, all right, guys, thank you so much. You guys be safe, and we'll see you on Friday. Could I thank you, bug you, Your Honor, for something not about that case or any sure. case? Um, we have two new attorneys that just passed the bar. We were wondering if Yay. anybody is <laughs> at the courthouse <laughs> swearing in attorneys uh, this week so that we might be able to get them. I would love to. Uh, I could do later today. Yeah. The best days for me would be later today or uh, Friday. Friday. What, what do you prefer? Yeah, later today would be stellar. Do you, yeah. do you have their names? Yes. Do you know Daniel's last name? Yeah, Daniel Gonzalez and Brittany Galvan are the two. New Is board. Gonzalez with a Z? Z, I think. Yes. Gonzalez. And you said Brittany. How do you spell Brittany? Uh, A N Y, yeah, A N Y. Two T's, A N Y. Yep. And then Galvan, G A L V A N. Uh, what time do they want to come in? Um, um, what time works for you, Your Honor? We can we'll walk over whenever. Uh, one one third. Let me just check my calendar. I should I should be. I have a bunch of people coming in today, so let me try to work it around my calendar. But that hey, I would love to do that. I'm always happy to do that kind of stuff. Um, let me look real quick. Uh, One thirty works perfectly. Okay. Excellent. Thank you so much, Your Honor. Of Thanks course, sir. of course. Whenever you guys need that, feel free to always reach out to me. I love doing that kind of stuff. It's it's the joy in my job is weddings, <laughs> which I don't get to do as much as I used to because of COVID, and then swearing people in. Um, just do let them know that everyone has to wear a mask at the courthouse. So. We'll do. Of course. All right, guys, we will see you uh, in a, a little bit and we'll see the rest of you guys Friday on Friday. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you much. Appreciate it. Thank you, guys. All right. I think we saw the other folks on the Dallas Chong Young uh, Presbyterian Church. If anyone is here on that case, go ahead and turn on their uh, cameras. You can go to. Hi. Hi. Hello. Yeah. All right. Miss Mr. Lee or Miss Lee, do you have counsel here? Do you have an attorney? Huh? Oh no. 
the alternative. Oh, please, I can speak English, so I need to translate. You need a translator? To, to... Yeah. Okay. Uh, Mr. Gaines, uh, why don't you uh, why don't you go ahead and make your argument, and then uh, and then they can respond. Okay. Uh, is it okay if I share my screen, Your Honor? Sure. Thank you, Judge. Can you see where it should say trial pad on there? Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, Your Honor, this is a case about a church that has obviously internal controversy amongst its leadership. And it's a church that right now the top level of leadership within the church is not able to govern. They've been excluded from the property. They have been told by the Dallas Police Department that they're unable to attend any functions. They've been issued criminal trespass citations. And further, the top leadership in the church has also been excluded from all of the church bank accounts. Uh, there's not any idea of where those funds are, where they've gone, how they've been spent. The faction on the other side of this <laughs> has purportedly hired staff members and have done things. And today, Judge, we would request that this court give us a temporary restraining order because there is harm that is imminent and irreparable. The plaintiff in this case is likely to succeed on the merits and there is no adequate remedy at law. And judge just briefly from a top level, the governance of the church, it's a congregational church. It's not a hierarchical church that is governed and controlled by a denomination. So within the church, the case law tells us that we should look to the highest governing level of authority within the church. Some churches, it's the congregation. Some churches, it's a board of elders. Here in this church, per the document that is entitled the Articles, it's the functional equivalent to bylaws at most nonprofit organizations or churches. In this church's articles, it designates that that highest level of authority within the church belongs to a body called the session. And the session is made up of elders and a senior pastor, but within the church, we have a designation that is made and in that designation it says that whenever the senior pastor is removed that the session is suspended and that the governance of the church is taken over by a steering committee and in 2019 there was a resignation of a senior pastor the session was suspended a steering committee was appointed and within the items that were appointed by the new steering committee we have the actually the enactment of these articles that we're relying upon today and you can see there's several names that are here everything's written in korean we've sub had some of those translated by a professional translation entity and uh, those have been provided to the court within the briefing but you have several names that are here you have mr park you have miss kim you have miss lee who is one of the defendants in this case you have Mr. Jin, and then you have Ms. Shin, who is also another one of the defendants in this case. And this goes to August of 2020, um, a little over a year ago. And it was at this time that when the steering committee was moving, um, there started to be some controversies that happened amongst the, the different congregational members. And judges, you look through the ebb and flow of the board we had starting back at that time in 2020 we had a board that consisted of the folks that i just read you that were signed there on the articles and on or about september 30th 2020 mr jung moved to korea he resigned from his position on the steering committee and in november of 2020 miss lee resigned her position on the steering committee as uh, steering committee member and then also treasurer of the church so she became a 
just a standard church member at that time. And then also, I believe she functioned as a deacon in the church as well. And deacons don't serve on the steering committee. Um, later on, you can see the board went through several more changes that was articulated in the briefing as well. On February the 28th of 2021, the steering committee members, they appointed three new individuals. Their names are listed there on the presentation. Mr. Choi failed to show to any meeting, so he had his membership on the steering committee terminated. So as of June the 13th, 2021, you can see the composition. We have Mr. Park, who is currently a steering committee member, Ms. Kim, who is currently a steering committee member, and then you have Mr. Bay, and Mr. Bay is the individual that passed away unexpectedly, uh, I believe last uh, Wednesday. Um, so at that time, and at the time that we filed the case, Mr. Park, Ms. Kim, and Mr. Bay, they were the governing steering committee members um, uh, at, the, at the time. So you can still see Ms. Shen's name and Mr. Wu um, is on there as well. And then in September of 2021, a majority of the steering committee, they voted to remove the membership of Ms. Lee from the church. And included in our briefing, Judge, we have a copy of a letter. And you can see the letter is from September the 8th of this year. And the letters, terms, and all of this was included in the briefing in your packet as well from the steering committee, and it was terminating Ms. Lee's membership in the church because of the, the disagreements um, that were happening. And at the time, it was signed here. You can see we have Mr. Park, Mr. Bay, and Ms. Kim as the active steering committee uh, folks that were there. And then we have some minutes, and again, these are in Korean. I just wanted to call out to the court the signature of Mr. Park and Mr. Bay from September the 5th of this year. And the substance of these minutes, we had this, this is translated. The substance of these minutes, it's to terminate the membership of Ms. Shin. And the date is of effective date, September, September the 10th, 2021. Uh, this was a meeting that was with Mr. Park, Ms. Kim, and Mr. Bay. And it was recorded, Ms. Kim functions as the secretary of the entity, the corporate secretary. And there are the, um, the signatures couldn't be on the translation, but that's from the translation that we had uh, done on this. So judge, where that leaves us is we have a situation now where with Mr. Bay's passing, Ms. Sin terminated and Ms. Lee terminated. Uh, we were at a position where we only had two board members. We had Mr. Park and we had uh, Ms. Kim. So what we did was the board met last week and you can find in your materials, a unanimous consent resolution and in the unanimous consent resolution, it talks about everything that we have discussed here today. Whereas on October 6, 2021, Mr. Bay passed, uh, the steering committee met, and then Song Un Nam was appointed as, appointed as a qualified person to serve on the steering committee. So judge, as it stands right now, and as is included in all of our briefing, we have a steering committee in the church that is governed by uh, Chong Un Nam, who was just appointed with the unanimous consent resolution. Mr. Park, who's always been a member of the steering committee. He has continuity going all the way back to the time in 2019 when the senior pastor was terminated. And then you have Miss Kim, and she has continuity as well, going all the way back to when the senior pastor was terminated. Mr. Park and Miss Kim have been members of the church since 2010, and they've functioned and served on the steering committee that entire time. So judge, as the steering committee being the ultimate and the highest authority within the church, they do not have access to bank accounts. They've been told that they'd be criminally trespassed if they entered the property. 
And judge, that's irreparable who, harm. Who told them this? Who has ex, who has uh, possession of the books and records now? Miss Lee and Miss Shin have contacted the police. They've changed the locks on the building and have excluded access. And they have contacted the bank. And now, the Ms. bank. Shin and Miss Lee were both former members of the steering committee. Correct. Correct. Yes, Judge. Okay. Former right. members. And how, how was Miss Shin? I wasn't exactly clear. How was she removed? Miss Shin was removed by virtue of this document here. It is meeting minutes from September the 10th of 2021. And the heading is membership termination from the members of the steering committee. And it pertains to Miss Shin. Uh, no English. My yes. no English, Mrs. Shin. I guess so. Hmm. And notice the meeting was noticed, Judge, and it was held in between Miss Kim, Mr. Park, and Mr. Bay. It was a unanimous vote to have her removed from the steering committee there on that date. Is there a procedure where you can remove someone, like a majority vote allows you to remove someone from the steering committee? Yes, Judge. And where is that found, What that authority? It would be found in the articles. You have to bear with me for a second to find the. What is that? Tetanus. Gaines, are you still there? I am, Judge. I'm trying to find that particular uh, provision for you. Judge, I can't find it right this second, um, but I can supplement to the court that information. There would, you know, always be a provision within governing documents that would um, allow, you know, for the removal of, of certain members. And we don't have an issue as to, you know, we had a majority vote on that at all times. I can tell you there is nothing in here that would require a super, super majority. Um, if, if anything, the actual articles that we have here might be absent or quiet on that particular issue. Mm -hmm. um, the Korean Presbyterian Church governance, and we're, we have a, a Korean copy of that, it might spell out in a little bit more detail um, what that procedure would look like. But we had a unanimous vote from Mr. Bay from Ms. Kim and from Mr. Park to remove them from- Did from you put Ms. Sin on notice? Of this is she defended as well she is and she's here judge she's here with miss lee oh okay she's on the same screen yes judge okay uh and just so it's clear though so it's miss mr lee and miss, miss it's miss lee and miss shin miss lee miss shin okay um mr miss lee miss shin did you have a response to what mr Gaines said no we don't understand the English, uh, yeah. But so I just uh, ask you, uh, you honor, as we know, the law gives the uh, three business day, but I received the uh, Friday night, and the next day, Saturday, Sunday, today is Columbus Day, so I can, you know. Uh, I, I don't have the, you know, business day. It's, uh, we need more, it's a time to get the legal help. So please let us have three business day. Okay. Mr. Gaines, what, what is the next church service, I guess, next Sunday? 
Yeah. It would be Sunday, yes. Judge. Um, one of the issues is that the church leases the facility to two other churches. There's a Spanish ministry that uses it, and then there's another church that uses it. So there's folks that use it on Wednesdays and then on Friday evenings. And then also the prior interim pastor is completely locked out of his office and, and can't use it. So even though a service is on Sunday, uh, we'd like to have access before then so that he could get in and retrieve his, his things and, and study and, and do what he needs to do there on the property. And it, it, is there a new, do they, so Miss Lee and Miss Sin, do, do they, have, is there a pastor they're working with that is running the services now? Uh, that's one of the issues, Judge, from information and belief at this stage, brand new case, uh, we were under the understanding that they hired a full-time senior pastor in just the couple of days in between all of the controversy here. Okay. Uh, <laughs> we needed, you know, translate, you know, and then uh, actually, we really need the uh, three days business day. So I want to uh, next week, something like that, you know, we need the three uh, legal business day. I need. So I just got the letter uh, Friday night, Saturday. Sunday, Columbus Day, all the holidays. So I can hire the, you know, lawyer. So after three days, we're gonna hire the uh, lawyer and then, you understand? <laughs> yes, I understand. Uh, so we'll go ahead and- I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, Mr. Mr. Gaines, I don't disagree with this. This is pretty convoluted what's happened here. So uh, I wanna give them a chance to yeah. Mm -hmm. Council. So we're going to allow this to, hearing to go forward on Friday morning. We're going to reset this to Friday morning at 10 o'clock. Okay. Perfect. Friday Judge, morning. I found that I found the provision that I think will help us here. It's it's on chapter three and it's included there in the briefing, but it just it states that the session is in charge of discipline, reprimand, suspension and expulsion. There's not a procedure included within here as far as what the voting would look like, but we had a unanimous vote from the then existing um, folks um, that were on that. So we couldn't have had a higher vote, but it's uh, section three, chapter two, and it's subpart. Okay, well, yeah. uh, hopefully they'll get counsel to try to clarify this. This is a little unusual that you're able to just move, remove people from the steering committee uh, on a majority vote, uh, but uh, but I you know I, I want to give them a chance to get counsel. So we're going to move this to Friday at ten o'clock. Uh, Mr. Miss Lee, Miss Sin, you need to get counsel by then, uh, if at all possible. We're going to go forward, uh, and you can contact my court coordinator Rhonda uh, to get any contact information. Do you have uh, Miss Lee's uh, email address? Email we can call judge and provide that to them. I'd be glad to do that. Okay, go go ahead and go ahead, uh, Mr. Gaines. Go ahead and call Rhonda, my court reporter, and make sure that we have their contact information as well. Uh, and uh, we'll see you guys back Friday at ten o'clock. You'll get a new Zoom link. New okay. Zoom link, not this one. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Friday. Friday at ten o'clock. October. This Friday at 10 o'clock. Okay. Right. This Next Friday, time. 10 o'clock. Okay. Okay. Right. okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Judge. I need to right. translate next time. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Tashi, Tashi, Tashi. Okay. Our next hearing, I believe, is on Boeki versus Collins. Anyone here on that case? Yes, Your Honor. Charles Bennett here for the defendants, um, the Collins defendants. And Byron Henry on behalf of the uh, plaintiffs, Your Honor. Okay. Uh, is that everyone we're expecting today? I think so. Okay.
Uh, this is a uh, summary judgment. Do y'all need a record for this? Yes, please. Okay, Tony, you there? Yes, Judge. Let's go on the record on clause number DC1911293, Boecki versus Collins. Council, make your appearances. Charles Bennett for the Collins defendants and counter plaintiffs. Byron Henry on behalf of Bradley Boki and Bayside Dental Mesquite uh, PLLC, Your Honor. Let's proceed. Um, Your Honor, can I make sure that is Mr. Henry representing um, both Bokies in this hearing? Oh, I apologize. Yes. Also, on behalf of Carolyn Boki, third party defendant, Your Honor. And, and I will say I've read all the briefing on this, so you don't have to go into a whole ton of detail. OK, and I'm going to narrow it down for the court so we can focus on um, what I think are the, the important issues here. First, the so we filed an MSJ on their breach of contract claims or our breach of contract claim, their breach of contract claims against us. I'm sorry. And they have two. One is for these liens and encumbrances, which is about um, 930 some dollars. And they have a breach of contract claim related to transfer of the phone number. Um, the Bokies have objected to this being too late. But as the court, I'm sure, remembers, um, this is the second setting and the court asked us to be here. Uh, so I think that objection is is miss, um, is is not valid. Um, we're going to move to strike her affidavit that's attached to their response um, because we took the depositions of all the parties for the Bokies and this ep this affidavit is an attempt to create a fact issue when they could have proved up their case and they didn't in the, in the depositions. Uh, as the court knows, the elements of a contract are one, does it exist? Two, did the other side perform? Three, um, did Ms. Collins breach? And four, are there any damages that the other side can claim? We're not going to contest one or two. There's clearly a contract that exists. And the notice period um, uh, for, for the other side performing, we're not going to contest that. So we're focusing on whether they can prove that our client breached the contract. We're going to waive the MSJ on the liens and encumbrances claim. Um, in paragraph five of the affidavit that's attached to the Bokey's response, um, Carolyn Bokey says there's about 930 some dollars worth of liens and encumbrances uh, that we're not going to contest as far as creating a fact issue for trial. We are going to go forward with the no evidence MSJ on their breach of contract claims related to the phone number being disconnected. Um, and this was the subject of their TRO that they filed that was dropped. So basically what this is, is that they're claiming we breached the contract because we failed to deliver a phone number that they told us was in, our, in their name. And when I asked them at deposition, if they had any information that our client had caused the disruption or disconnection of the phone number, they testified no. This is on page 11 of our summary judgment uh, the question was, okay, but at that point on August 5th, uh, you had no information from anybody that Dr. Collins had caused this, meaning the interruption and disconnection of the phone number, and Carolyn Bokey testifies correct. That's on Exhibit 2, page 64, line 20 through 23. In response, the Bokeys file an affidavit from Carolyn Bokey, the same person that was in the deposition, and this is paragraph 7 of her affidavit, which is on page 25 of their response, where she says, quote, Charlotte Collins, my client, refused to provide the PIN number to the AT&T representative to facilitate transfer of the telephone number unless plaintiffs agreed to dismiss their case. So what the Bokies are doing is they're using a settlement negotiation from after the lawsuit was filed as evidence of a breach of contract for them filing their suit. So we would first object that this is a settlement negotiation, and second, that this is, not, this is not any evidence of a breach of contract. It happens after the case is filed, and uh, at, when, the, when they filed the lawsuit, they had no evidence that our client had breached the contract. This is also the topic of our motion for sanctions for them filing this frivolous lawsuit in a frivolous TRO without any evidence. So that's our issues on the breach of contract. Now, the, the damages issue, can they prove damages for breach of contract? And the answer is no. 
Um, they claim as a in paragraph paragraphs eight and nine of Carolyn Bokey's affidavit that's attached to their response. She says, quote, as a result of Collins's conduct, Bayside Dental went without an active telephone number for seven days. Consequently, Bayside Dental suffered damages in the form of lost patients and resulting profits derived therefrom during that time period. Bayside Dental also suffered damages in the form of goodwill associated with its business as a result of its inability to answer calls, set appointments, and otherwise service its patients during the time telephone service was not available. So they have lost patients, lost profits, and lost goodwill, but they have not designated a dep um, an expert on any of these topics. <clears throat> and their clients testified that they have no expertise to testify about this. They have no affidavits from any patients that they lost any, any business. They have no witness statements. They have no statements whatsoever to say that they lost any business as a result of this phone being disconnected. And they've attached nothing more than this affidavit to their response. So our argument is that the MSJ should be granted because they have no evidence of any damage as a result of the phone number being disconnected. Response? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, first and foremost, um, they attached a lot of evidence to their no evidence motion, but the Supreme Court has said, I think, quite cl clearly that if they attach evidence to a no evidence motion, the court can only consider that evidence for purposes of creating a fact issue. Um, I think that's well settled. So I'm going to concentrate only on the two items he's argued with respect to our evidence. Uh, first, they haven't filed any objections to the affidavit. There's no motion to strike. Uh, at least I haven't received it. So as of today, as you sit here today, according to the case law, the court can only rule on objections that are filed in writing prior to the hearing. And uh, there are none. So for purposes of this hearing, uh, there's no objected to evidence. Um, with respect to the uh, uh, damage evidence with respect, he's waived the MSJ. So we actually don't have multiple claims. We have one breach of contract claim and, and two different sets of damages, one for lost patients and goodwill and the other for the uh, uh, unpaid trade debt. He's conceded that unpaid trade debt survives. So that we're only talking about lost patients. Um, you don't have to be an expert to say whether or not patients were lost. You may, you may need expert testimony in some instances to actually come up with the amount of damages suffered, Your Honor, but you don't need damage, you don't need an expert to testify that damages were suffered. We cited one case, the SNS case, uh, in our response, which basically sets the standard for whether or not um, a uh, there's sufficient evidence to raise a prima facie case of damages. And that's basically if a um, trier of fact can reasonably infer that some damages were suffered, uh, not a specific amount of damages for purposes uh, at this stage of the case. Um, there's also a case we cited that says that we don't lose on summary judgment based on damages because we can't prove the exact amount of damages that we suffered. And we believe um, uh, non-economic damages, such a loss of goodwill, can be reasonably inferred from the fact that a party didn't have a phone number uh, for seven days. Obviously, the amount isn't proven here, but the contract is in evidence. It was submitted by Mr. Bennett, which you can rely on to create a fact issue. And it actually assigns a value of goodwill to the practice, uh, an actual number in the contract. So um, based on that, there is evidence in the record that there is goodwill related to this practice and that some goodwill was lost. Therefore, there is some evidence of damages. Um, so based on the evidence before the court on that issue, if that's all we're going forward on is whether or not there's any evidence in the record to support some damage was suffered as a result of not having a phone number for five days or seven days, I think there is sufficient evidence in the record for a, for a jury to infer some damage was suffered, even if the court at this stage can't determine the amount. Um, one thing with respect to the settlement negotiation, if you read the citations uh, to the record we provided, which we are allowed to provide evidence in response to so no evidence, of course, um, it was in a phone call with an AT&T rep wasn't settlement negotiations as Mr. Bennett represented. An AT&T representative was on the phone with Ms. Collins and my client in a three-way type call and asked her, could you please give me the pin? And Ms. Collins told the AT&T rep that she wouldn't give the pin unless they dismissed the case. Not my client. There was no negotiations there. Of course, there's no objection in the record, but I just wanted to clarify, this wasn't the parties negotiating a settlement and me bringing that to your attention. This is evidence that was testified to in the deposition where Ms. Collins admitted that she wouldn't give the 
four-digit PIN to the AT&T representative for purposes of the transfer um, unless we dismissed our case. So it's just evidence that, in fact, she had the, the ability to transfer. I'd also like to point out one quick thing, Your Honor. The, 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 um, based on the record before the court in a no evidence motion, the, the contract says that the number has to be transferred. It's an absolute obligation. If it's, if it's our breach or if it's, inex, if it's excuse or if it's impossibility to transfer, as Mr. Bennett seems to argue from the evidence, those are defenses like failure to mitigate that he also raises in his motion. Those are defenses that you can't do a no evidence motion on. So if there's a reason Ms. Collins couldn't satisfy her obligation to transfer the number, and there may well be, Your Honor, um, uh, that's for him to prove up as a defense. But this case, the contract in the record that he presented says she must transfer the n number before closing. It is undisputed in this record that number was not transferred at closing. That alone is enough to prove breach right there without a defense, obviously a reason why it wasn't um, uh, presented, which they have alleged some defenses in their answer, but that's obviously not the subject of today's motion before your honor, because this is a no evidence motion. So between abs undisputed evidence in today's record that the number wasn't transferred, undisputed evidence of trade debts not paid, and undisputed evidence that patients were lost and goodwill was lost as a result of not having a phone number for seven days, we believe based on the limited basis Mr. Uh, Bennett has presented today, the court should deny uh, defendants no evidence motion for summary judgment. Thank you. Response? Um, when we're talking about damages for the, uh, for the phone number being disconnected, they want the jury to infer that people must have called the number and wanted to do business with them and that they lost that business because the number was out. There's no way. They don't have any evidence that anybody tried to call and as a result of the number being disconnected, couldn't. They would need expert testimony. They would need uh, witness statements. They would need something besides their own clients saying, well, the phone number didn't work, therefore we lost business. That's, that's insufficient and that's not any evidence of any damages. So in terms of the phone number being down for... Um, them suffering some damages for the seven days that that phone number was down, they have no evidence. And about the phone call with AT&T, first of all, uh, the Bokies told Ms. Collins that the phone number had been transferred, that AT&T told them the phone number was transferred. So at the time of closing, it was transferred. And then on the phone with AT&T after the lawsuit was filed, AT&T said, we need the phone number. And Collins says, well, are you going to dismiss the case? That's trying to settle that's trying to negotiate a settlement of the case, whether it's with AT&T as a go-between or not. And by the way, it happened after the lawsuit. So that's no evidence of any damages or breach of contract, Your Honor. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, deny the summary judgment. Uh, do we have an order, Mr. Henry, that you submitted? I believe so, Your Honor. I will double check that, but I believe there was an order. I, I, I didn't see one in the record. Let me see if I can pull it up. Uh, maybe you can see it. And I just missed it. Uh, I'm going to share screen. Do you... Um, do you see it? I just don't see it. I don't see it, Your Honor, either. So if you could go ahead... Uh, Please uh, prepare an order, share it with Mr. Bennett, make sure on the order it says that this hearing was heard on October 8th, uh, 2021. It should be a very simple denial of summary judgment and we don't need a lot of extra language in it. And uh, just try to get that to me as, as soon as you can. Make sure you e-file it and email my court coordinator as well. October 11th, Your Honor, did you mean to say? The hearing? I'm sorry. Uh, October 11th, correct, I'm sorry. That's fine. Yes, Your Honor, I will do so. Thank you. You have a great day. Thank you, Judge. All right. Do we have, I think we have some folks here at MCD Enterprises versus Westdale Properties or both sides here. Mr. Miller, you're muted. Mr. Frick, you're muted. Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Frick, you're, I can't hear you. Still can't hear you. It doesn't look like you're muted, so I don't know what's going on. Your sound may be off, or
Mr. Frick, are you there? Can you hear us? I know, but we can't hear you. Okay. Maybe you signed on without, maybe you, if you want to sign off and sign back on, maybe when you signed on, you didn't uh, activate your sound. That's You have to activate your sound. I don't know what he's saying, but is anyone here on any other cases besides the MCD case? If you are, go ahead and... Uh, Can anyone else hear Mr. Frick? I can't hear him. Can't hear him, Your Honor. Is anyone here on any other cases? Okay. Mr. Frick, you're going to have to, I would suggest you sign off and I'm just going to remove Mr. Frick because I don't know if he can hear me and then he can sign back on. Mr. Frick, can you hear us? Can you hear? Can you speak? We cannot hear you. I can't either, Judge Hoffman. Ms. Covington, can you hear Mr. Frick? Can you go ahead and turn your sound on so we can hear you? I cannot hear Mr. Frick, Your Honor. Mr. I'm not no, sure how to no. say the name. Mr. Needham, you need hear Your Honor. I can't hear, I can't hear Mr. Frick. I can hear yourself, Your Honor, Mr. Miller and Ms. Covington. Okay, thank you, Mr. Frick.
Mr. Frick? Your Honor, do you hear me? Yep, we can hear you now. I don't know what was wrong with your computer before, so we're all good. I have uh, no idea. It is, it's, you know, the era of Zoom. Uh, so, uh, all right, let's go ahead and get started with the summary judgment. Uh, do you guys want a record? Uh, not necessary, Your Honor. Okay. Anybody want a record? No, no thank you. Okay, let's go ahead and proceed. Judge Hoffman, this is uh, our motion. Uh, and Judge Hoffman, do, do you want me to go kind of through background of what the case is about? Or do you want no, me to- No, I've read it? everything. Just get kind of hit to the high mm -hmm. points. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Your Honor, what is before the court now is a motion for partial summary judgment. And, and, and they've made two... Uh, they've asked the court to make two declarations, Your Honor. It's on page 22 of the first amended petition. I can put that up unless it's easier for you, Your Honor, to get there. No, go ahead. Okay. Your Honor, what's before the court now is, is slightly different than at the time I drafted the motion for partial summary judgment, but the same argument still, supply, still applies. They're asking the court to make two declarations. What is the correct amount owed to Greenleaf for the work described in Greenleaf's lien and whether Canton Loft COA or VE or both is responsible to pay Greenleaf for its work. There are a number of problems, Your Honor. First of all, Greenleaf is not in this lawsuit anymore. And I do not know how they overcome that. Uh, it was really not addressed in their papers. Greenleaf has been dismissed from this lawsuit. Greenleaf was a party, is not a party. And as we quoted from the statute, Your Honor, it is not a shall or it, it, is, it is not a may, it is a must. The deck action statute says when declaratory relief is sought, all persons who have or claim any interest that would be affected by the declaration must be made a party. Greenleaf isn't here. The case law is also clear. We cited the uh, transportation insurance case, which said the rights and status of the parties before the court are what the court can decide. Further, Your Honor, they're asking the court to decide something that it can't resolve. These issues are in another court with the proper parties. We put the style of the case in our reply, Judge Hoffman. Uh, we're over in county court now determining whether anyone owes Greenleaf for its work. Uh, Mr. Needenfuhrer's client and my client both vehemently deny that Greenleaf is owed anything. But that is being decided with Greenleaf in another case. The only thing I can see is, is that uh, MCD tried to frame the issue in their response by saying, well, the court can determine as between the two parties who are in the case, the court can determine which one of them might be responsible. And that's where they say whether Canton Loft 
the, 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 the condo association or VE, the subcontractor, or both? Well, Judge Hoffman, it's true that Canton Loft and VE are in the case, but Greenleaf isn't. And Greenleaf is certainly a party that's going to be affected by this ruling. And again, and I, I hate to beat the dead horse, uh, and I really don't know why we had to file this motion. Um, that's in another court. There's no opinion that the court can give here without a decision of whether Greenleaf is owed any money, and that is in the county court. You know, they gave a lot of argument about, you know, theoretically they've been damaged and, you know, there's, there's some, some, some theory that they've been damaged by Greenleaf's lien. Well, <clears throat> then they probably dismissed the wrong party when they dismissed Greenleaf for nothing. And if they have some actions against the condo association or VE, it's not in a deck action. So I'm at a loss as to what more to say, Judge Hoffman. I'll certainly That's answer fine. any questions you uh, Response? Yes, Your Honor. With respect to this case, the delay in our ability to persuade Greenleaf to release its lien, which as you can see from the summary judgment evidence, we got them to release the lien on May 21st of 2021, armed my client by preventing it from being able to market the condo that it had purchased. The summary judgment evidence clearly shows that when they went to, when my client went to market the unit in the fall of 2019, the realtor refused to list the unit because the green leaf lien had in fact been filed and encumbered my client's unit. My client filed this lawsuit. And I, the one thing I would differ with uh, uh, my counsel on is that, uh, or my opposing counsel on is my client should not have had to file this lawsuit. Uh, the contract between VE and Greenleaf required them to arbitrate any construction disputes. They should have arbitrated that long before a lien uh, was ever filed by Greenleaf. But the undisputed facts before the court clearly shows that Greenleaf did in fact perform work pursuant to a subcontract, that the subcontract required VE to pay Greenleaf for its work, and that Greenleaf was not paid for work in the amount of $217,217.10. Now, whether you know, there, there's arguments about the legal effect of the lien that have been raised before in this case. But the fact of the matter is, uh, after the deposition of Nicholas Bass and after the production of documents that was made in this case, the one thing that is very clear is, yes, there was a contract. Yes, VE obligated itself to pay Greenleaf for services. Undisputed Greenleaf performed the services. Undisputed Greenleaf was not paid for the services. The only issue remaining is whether or not Greenleaf should have been paid by VE or by Canton Law COA, hence the declaratory judgment suit. Uh, it may very well be that VE's argument that Canton Law should pay is with merit. I don't know. Or it may be that Canton Law's argument that VE should have been the one to pay is with merit. Again, I don't know. But whoever did that wrongful conduct, whoever failed to pay Green how, how do we how do we go forward with this client with this case without Greenleaf present though? Well we non-suited at Greenleaf in exchange for the release of the lien after the deposition and after the evidence it, so so your your damages you're seeking are essentially the damages that were in place while the lien was in effect, right? And we're seeking those uh, against either the HOA or uh, VE, in, in part depending upon who was responsible to pay. The reason we non-suited Greenleaf after its principal was deposed 
is that clarified a number of things as to whether or not uh, Greenleaf did perform some work and wasn't paid for some work. You know, at this point in this case, it's undisputed that Greenleaf performed work, that the value of that work was $217 or $217,217.10, and they were not paid for that work, and that's why they filed their lien. Now, an argument can be made that they shouldn't have filed the lien against individual unit owners, and I think Mr. Needenfuhrer is going to make that argument, but that doesn't help my client. The fact of the matter is that because this lien was filed, my client couldn't market his property. So the issue that the sole issue that VE has moved for summary judgment on is that by me, by me being able to secure a partial release of lien in May of this year, uh, that finally released the lien that Greenleaf had against my client's unit solely, that that mute, moots the whole issue of the declaratory judgment. But it doesn't, because as a result of that lien being in place, as well as other factors set forth in the lawsuit, my client couldn't sell his unit for almost two years. And my client has suffered damages because it had a bridge loan at a 9.5% interest rate that it had to pay while this whole thing got sorted out. So at the end of the day, I think there's gonna be declaratory relief granted. In addition, V is asking that the court should award it attorney's fees uh, under the declaratory judgment statute because they are the prevailing party. They're not the prevailing party. They haven't prevailed over anything. I'm the one who got Greenleaf to release its lien as a part of, of, of in an agreement to non what about and what about this case in county court? Uh, I understand that there is a case in county court between parties. My client is not a party to that lawsuit. I believe that lawsuit may have been filed after our lawsuit was filed. And I understand that that is a dispute between VE, Canton Loft, and Greenleaf over who, who needs to pay Green. Your Honor. If, if I may, Mr. Frick, I don't want to cut you off, but no, Your Honor, if I may, all of this undisputed stuff is all disputed. It's being disputed in the case where it's supposed to be disputed. We're not arguing who's supposed to pay Greenleaf. My client initiated an arbitration against Greenleaf long before Mr. Frick filed this lawsuit, just as we were supposed to do. We think Greenleaf owes us a tremendous amount of money. And unless and until that issue is decided, Mr. Frick's theoretical argument here is, is meaningless. There is no authority for the notion that the court can grant a declaratory judgment without the proper parties before it. I, I guess I'm, I'm trying to, kind of, this is kind of an unusual case. Uh, I'm trying to wrap, why, why does Greenleaf have to be a part of this lawsuit? I understand why it has to be the other lawsuit, but this is simply a single condominium or uh, condominium owner, I guess, uh, that is claiming there was a wrongful lien against the, it uh, because let's say they're, they're telling the truth. Your clients didn't uh, properly pay uh, a subcontractor and it caused him difficulties and or his client difficulties and uh, marketing the project. I could see there being damages for that if, if that's true. I'm trying to figure out why Greenleaf would have to be a, a party to that. Uh, Your Honor, I, I, under the statute, certainly Greenleaf would be interested in whether any money was owed to them. And that's what you're being asked to decide. But, but it's not, it doesn't state. matter if, if Greenleaf was owed money it, it's whether or not the lien was wrongful, right? No, Your Honor, that's, that, that's not necessarily true. And also that's being decided in the other case as well. Th th that's my biggest concern, I guess, is, is the fact that this is being litigated in another case. Uh, I guess Your maybe Honor, the, the, the more appropriate thing would be to consolidate this case into that case or vice versa, but I'm not even sure that's the right, the right 
resolved or maybe abate this case until the other case is resolved. Um, that's a possibility too. Uh, I just, I'm not as concerned about Greenleaf not being in this case. I'm more concerned about the fact that we could have inconsistent rulings in our court versus the county court. Uh, how do you deal with that issue, Mr. Frick? Well, Your Honor, you're not being asked to enter a judgment that says Greenleaf is recovering X dollars or Y dollars or who it's being recovered from. You're asking, we're asking you to make a declaratory judgment that's going to go into the proportionate responsibility of VE and the Canton Law COAs for the damages that my client suffered. My client's damages are well, not. And the client, but it arises out of whether or not there was a lien in place uh, that, that they this. would be responsible for, right? Correct. If, if, VE, paid, if VE paid Greenleaf what it was entitled to be paid, when it was entitled to be paid, the court would make a declaratory judgment that the VE was not the party responsible to pay Greenleaf, and therefore VE is not responsible for any damages caused to my client as a result of the lien being filed against it. But, but VE and I forget the other name of the company, VE and what is the other one? Can't, uh, Canton Lofts, Your Honor. Canton, Canton Lofts. Lofts. If V and Kent Lofts, uh, if they did properly pay uh, Greenleaf and there and this was a wrongful lien that Greenleaf filed, uh, then you would have no damages against them, correct? I would have no damages resulting from the Greenleaf lien being filed. That's correct. There's other aspects to this case. For example, there's the defective construction work that was done by V. That, that's not what we're here about today. That's not, that's not what we're deciding today, correct? We're just right. this partial summary judgment on the declaratory relief today. So, so, the, so the question is that in the county court, they're making the determination of whether or not Greenleaf was owed money, right? Correct. Or whether or not my client is owed money by Greenleaf. Okay. I, 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 yes. The issue here is whether or not Greenleaf is owed money. And so if Greenleaf, if the, that court determines that uh, the Greenleaf was not owed money, then the lien was wrongful and Canton Lofts and, uh, and VE would not have been. I just don't know how you separate these two cases because they're so intertwined. That doesn't mean that summary judgment is necessarily proper at this point. Although I, I see the issues. Uh, it does it does concern me of how do you have two different cases without having inconsistent results? I mean, because they're so that at least that particular issue is intertwined. Maybe what makes sense, and, and I'm not ruling this today, is that this either this case be abated and this portion of this case or this case be abated until that case is re resolved or trial on this be abated till that because there's other claims I guess until that case is resolved but that case is going to make a determination that affects this case I just don't see how they're they're not intertwined and so um, and your honor they may very well be intertwined but the ground for the motion for summary judgment is that it's moot, that there's not a dispute at all. And counsel's arguing that there is a dispute. It's a hot dispute. There's arbitrations and other cases pending. Uh, it's certainly not moot, which is the sole ground before the court today on summary judgment. Uh, is that if, your sole ground, Mr. Miller? No, in fact, I don't use the word moot. The word moot appears in one of the citations Mr. Frick seized on that, but I'm not saying it's moot. Your Honor, I, I, I still believe that it is absolutely mandatory that Greenleaf be in this case. And Greenleaf was dismissed with prejudice. And so Mr. Frick chose his path. And he- Greenleaf was not he, dismissed with prejudice. He, he, he likely dismissed the wrong party. And if it's not with prejudice, I apologize. He could bring them back in presumably. But I do not understand how Greenleaf is not an interested party 
and the statute says must. And again, Your Honor, that's a counter argument that was raised for the first time by VE in reply to our response. The sole ground stated in the motion is that there is no justiciable controversy because the controversy has been resolved by the partial release of lien. It's not correct, Your Honor. I'll be happy to read the quote. There is no justiciable controversy as there is no lien and Greenleaf is no longer even a party to this case. That was front and center. It has always been front and center. It has never been addressed. I'm just trying to figure out is really Greenleaf a necessary party here? Uh... Because you're the basis of your lawsuit against VE and Kent Lofts is really did, was there a were they responsible for a wrongful a lien being filed against your their failure to pay responsible for uh, and if the jury says no then then I would lose on that issue. There's on that other issue, right? I mean, I, it seems to me, I don't understand why you would not want Greenleaf in here because if, if they either Greenleaf filed the wrongful lien or, uh, or Greenleaf filed a rightful lien, but it, but it was these other folks' fault. Well, Your Honor, at the time when Greenleaf agreed to release, to do a partial release of the lien on my client's unit, we had a pending earnest money contract with a closing date that ultimately fell apart. And we believe the evidence will show that it fell apart because the condominium association refused to release an assessment lien that had subsequently been placed against my client's unit as part of the sale. So at the time that we agreed to non-suit Greenleaf without prejudice, my client had a, a, an interest in being able to sell his unit. And in order to do that, we needed a partial release of lien. Now, I didn't need VE to do anything uh, to release that lien. Uh, Greenleaf agreed that notwithstanding whether they've been paid or not, they would give us a partial release of lien if we non-suited them so we could see if we could sell the unit. So that's why you know, we non-suited Greenleaf at that time. Now that sale subsequently fell through. There's subsequently been an assessment foreclosure and the prime lender is set to foreclose. Oh, oh, they, they, I'm sorry, they should have foreclosed last week on the unit. So now my client's damages are, are fairly liquidated. Uh, but it, the issue of whether or not VE was responsible in part for the placement of that lien back in October that precluded my client from selling the unit at the time is still very much alive in this case. It's just alive in another court with the proper parties. Yeah, I agree it's alive. I, I don't, I don't I, to the extent the argument is it's moot, I, I agree it's not moot. I'm just trying to figure out how you go forward here. Um, Uh, at this point, uh, you know, I do think that there's the uh, definitely strong argument that this maybe should be at least this portion of the claim should be consolidated into the county court or uh, that this portion of the claim should be abated until there's a resolution in the county court. Uh, I do think that that there could be an argument there. I think at this point, I'm going to go ahead and uh, deny the summary judgment. So, Mr. Frick, have you submitted a uh, proposed. Uh, yes, Your Honor. Be in your queue. Let me see. Do I have it? Uh, yep, I have it. I will sign it right now. So, um, all right, guys, anything else? That's all. Thank you, Your Honor. I'm not sure. Mr. Mims, are you here for this hearing or something else? I got a 
um, email. Uh, let's see what time it was today around 10 30 uh -huh. inviting me to a scheduled zoom meeting um on what case anyway everyone else you guys can go i just i'll go ahead and sign the order and then i'll talk to mr mims real quick um what what case was it on 20-01712, that's the Weaver versus KW Homes. I think that's the right number. Give me a second, Judge. Verify. Twenty dash zero one seven one two. Okay, so, so you said you sent a. All right, let me let me pull up the case real quick. I spoke to Miss Penton this morning. FYI, this was after, and she said uh, that you had a hearing today. Well, I thought we had a hearing today, but she informed me that a final judgment had been entered and sent me the final judgment. Um, so what what what's the cost number again? Twenty dash zero one. Seven one two. Let me see. Oh, let me. Uh, 